quadraphonic sound promised so much in 1970, but by the end of the decade it had been and gone. Surely it was the next great thing after high fidelity stereo records just a few years earlier. Why did it fail despite being available on three different recording mediums and over the air? How did the whole thing play out? And how can you enjoy those 1970s quadraphonic recordings today with equipment you likely already have at home? This is the quadraphonic story. Stereophonic sound was maybe the next great thing for the cinema after talkies, and various test recordings were made in the late 1930s and early 1940s, like this one of Glenn Miller in 1941. Stereo would invade the home in the 50s and 60s with high fidelity micro groove long players or LPs. But even as stereo gained popularity, there were some that saw that even stereo limited the full reproduction of the original sound. True sound reproduction didn't just come from the front, but from all around. The public would get their first surround sound experience in the 1950s with Cinerama. Film companies and cinemas had new competition in the form of television, so pulled out all the stops. Cinerama was the IMAX of its day with three projectors enveloping the audience in the action and 3D with its red and blue glasses produced some interest for a while. Sound got a makeover with five channels behind the screen and two surround channels in the rear. But like 3D it was a flash in the pan and most cinemas relied on mono or stereo. By the end of the 1960s there began experimentation with quadraphonic sound for the home market. One of the first times the public got to hear surround sound music was not at home, but during rock concerts. Pink Floyd introduced a custom control device, the Azimuth Coordinator, with dual joysticks for a live concert in 1967. The controller, operated by keyboard player Richard Wright, allowed each instrument to be moved to anywhere on the soundstage around the room. Some of the first quadraphonic home recordings appeared on reel-to-reel -reel machines in 1969. These machines were relatively easy to convert to support four channels, as many used two channels for stereo going one direction on the tape and two on the other side when the reel was turned around, like on a cassette. A four channel head could be wired up to take all four channels in at once and route them to two amplifiers to power four speakers. At the start it was known as surround stereo, but that would be renamed as Q4 quadraphonic sound. Companies like Vanguard Records produced these recordings and promised more to come on 8-track and cassette. Cassette never materialised, but 8-track Quad 8 or Q8 quadraphonic systems appeared a year later in 1970. The way 4-track audio worked on 8-track was similar to reel-to-reel. 8-track -reel. cartridges had, rather logically, 8 tracks of audio. With stereo cartridges they were split into 4 programmes. Quadraphonic recordings used four of the eight tracks, meaning that there were just two programs. The machine could tell the difference between stereo and quadraphonic tapes, as there was a cutout on the front of the quad cartridges. Some eight track tapes had both stereo and quadraphonic versions, and as you can see they contain the same number of songs, so it's likely that the quadraphonic version ran at half speed, although I can't confirm this. If anyone knows, please let me know in the comments. As 8-track wasn't the last word in quality, especially if it was being run at half speed, and players were often sold with cheap amplifiers and even cheaper speakers, it can't have been a fantastic audio experience. Records offered higher quality audio, and work had also begun to try to squeeze quadraphonic information into the vinyl groove. The first implementations were pretty rudimentary, using the fairly simple Hafler circuit. This exploited the phenomenon that rear ambient sounds, be it reverberations, applause or coughs, are sometimes received out of phase by stereo microphones, whereas the performance is received in phase. It was a similar principle to that used by Dolby Surround, and amplifiers using the Hafler circuit can partially decode Dolby Surround audio. Many classical recordings put the music on the front two channels with the reverberation of the room in the rear channels, giving the impression of sitting in an audience at a concert, 
and this system worked fairly well to generate this effect. But for rock, pop or jazz that could put instruments in any corner of the soundstage, the effect left a little to be desired. These early Hafler circuit systems, such as Radio Shack's Quattrovox, gave a quadraphonic effect, but it wasn't true separate quadraphonic, like had been demonstrated on Q4 Reel to Reel and Quad 8 8 track. Hafler circuit systems would become known as derived formats and would be sold as an entry level quadraphonic system, promising a big sound field for a small amount of cash. But engineers were working on a way of encoding true four channel information on an LP. The next generation became known as matrix formats, and the first was EV, also known as Stereo 4. Matrix formats had the advantage that the rear channel information was hidden in the sound, so records with this encoding could still be played on stereo equipment and sound perfectly normal to most listeners. This gave the customer confidence that they could purchase new quadraphonic records and be able to unlock their full potential when they saved up for the extra quadraphonic equipment. Radio Shack in the US pushed the Stereo 4 format hard, with claims it was an audio breakthrough of even greater significance than stereo. Four channel recordings were already being played on the radio in many cities and could be picked up by this new equipment, and all delivered by components with jet age styling. If marketers were to be believed, Quadraphonic was here to stay. A similar system was launched by Columbia Records in 1971, SQ or Stereo Quadraphonic. The price of SQ recordings was only a dollar more in the USA, that's about six dollars or five pounds in 2023. Columbia had created the LP and they played heavily on SQ being the next natural progression of their baby. But then, would you trust marketers who wrote, the disc still is and perhaps always will be the world's preferred playback system? A statement that was made obsolete just 10 years later with the compact disc. Columbia's weight brought quite a few record labels to their cause, CBS, Virgin, EMI and Epic. Sony agreed to provide the hardware using silicon chips to simplify the circuitry and therefore reduce the cost. The Stereo 8 and SQ formats were so similar that soon Radio Shack started supporting SQ with their hi-fi products in 1973. This type of quadraphonic encoding was better, but it still had problems. It was difficult to place a sound in the center rear because that sound would disappear in one channel mono listening. So rear sounds were generally reserved to only being in the left or the right channel. This wasn't a problem that was experienced by the reel-to-reel -reel and eight-track discrete four-channel recordings. When there's new technology, there's a new way for companies to make money. Each company wants to own the keys to the city in the form of their patents, which inevitably leads to a format war. This happened between RCA and Columbia with 45s and LPs. It happened again with VHS versus Betamax and would happen yet again with HD DVD and Blu-ray. But as they said in Highlander, there can be only one. A film that, by the way, would sound great in quadraphonic. So the last thing the new quadraphonic market needed was another competing technology. But the year SQ appeared, Sansui's QS, or Quadraphonic Sound, also made its debut. QS had another group of record labels supporting it, Decca, Warner, MCA and Electra. In hindsight, it might seem like madness that they didn't just bury the hatchet before they launched and consolidate to one standard the way that Sony and Philips did with DVD in the 1990s. But all that was in the future, and a result of bitter learned experiences like these. All this, of course, was bad news for the consumer. If they wanted to listen to quadraphonic music, they had to pick a side. And once chosen, they were excluded from recordings in the other camp. What the confusing quadraphonic marketplace needed was yet another format. CD4, also known as Quadradisc, arrived in 1972 courtesy of JVC and RCA, the company behind 45s. To be fair, CD4 was a big step over previous quadraphonic record formats. It promised to truly capture all four channels of information on an LP. They snagged another set of recording labels, A&M, Arista, Atlantic, Capricorn, Fantasy, Nonsuch, Reprise, and again Warner and Electra. 
To produce four discrete channels, the records carried additional audio information at a frequency range well above human hearing. This meant CD4 records played on stereo equipment sounded just like regular stereo recordings. But to hear CD4 recordings in all its quadraphonic glory, a special stylus with higher tolerances was required. Those CD4 records also needed to be manufactured to a higher tolerance, limiting how many places could manufacture them and therefore pushing up the price. Getting the setup just right was a finicky process, but when it worked, it was the best system out there, barring reel-to-reel. -reel. Across all of these formats, around 2,000 titles would be released. Audio manufacturers continued to push Quadraphonic for all it was worth. After all, this was the next progression of audio. There were even four channel headphones for that surround sound experience. Believe it or not, just two years after CD4, another quadraphonic format appeared to confuse consumers, UD4 from then on. It had a lot of similarities to the CD4 format, but as you might imagine, coming late to the feeding trough meant slim pickings. It didn't help that the system suffered from incompatibility with regular stereo playback. Less than 40 LPs were ever recorded. As I mentioned earlier, FM receivers were sold as four channel, being able to decode quadraphonic stereo 4 SQ or QS records broadcast over the airwaves. And there were stations that broadcast dedicated quadraphonic programming on two separate frequencies. But since 1969, there were efforts to broadcast discrete four-channel quadraphonic on the radio over one frequency band. The Quadruplex and Quadracast systems promised to do just that, and tests were carried out in 1970. The US Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, were wary that the new system that relied on two additional subcarriers wouldn't be compatible with the existing stereo receivers or that it could interfere with other stations, so the rollout was slow. Tests were still ongoing in 1976, with the more advanced Universal SQ format derived from regular SQ, and it got as far as discussions on how it should be adopted. But by this time, the interest in quadraphonic was evaporating, and so did interest from radio stations. Experiments were also carried out in the UK by the BBC in 1974. This resulted in Matrix H in 1977, a system similar to QS. Listener tests were conducted that year, but it was decided in 1978 not to take it forward. The work would be folded into the ambisonic surround sound format, technology that by the late 2010s got renewed interest from companies like Google for use in virtual reality. By 1974, the interest in quadraphonic from consumers was waning. They weren't buying quadraphonic equipment and records, be it SQ, QS, CD4 or UD4. To be fair, manufacturers realized fairly quickly that the format war wasn't going to end well for them and rushed out decoders and amplifiers that supported most formats. But some, like Radio Shack, didn't see the logic in pouring money into a technology that hadn't captured the imagination of the public and stuck with just selling SQD modulators and amplifiers. By 1977, quadraphonic products were starting to disappear from the shops, starting with quadraphonic 8-tracks and surround sound headphones. High-end amplifiers were being sold on features other than their ability to produce quadraphonic sound. By 1980, the 70s experiment with quadraphonic was over. Consumers' money went into VCRs and the hi-fi community concentrated on increasingly higher quality cassette recorders with Dolby noise reduction. Then of course compact discs appeared in the 1980s and the audiophile community warmed to their cool digital sound, at least initially. Quadraphonic would make an occasional appearance on CD. For example, Lotus by Santana included the SQ Quadraphonic information, which could still be decoded with the correct equipment. And the technology behind Quadraphonic sound would live on. As I mentioned earlier, Dolby Surround had a lot in common with the Hafla circuit, and an enhancement to SQ called Tate DS was used by Dolby in their theatre processors until it was replaced by Dolby Pro Logic. Rather than listening to Quadraphonic in your living room, you were watching Highlander in DTS or Dolby Atmos. The compact disc brought higher quality audio to the home, and in 1999 there was an attempt to add multi-channel audio to it. Super Audio CD supported up to six discrete channels, but this format also failed to gain any traction, and ten years after its release the major labels stopped releasing new discs. 
So why did Quadraphonic fail? It's easy to point the finger at the multiple incompatible formats, but hardware manufacturers quickly produced decoders that supported most of them. Even so, it must have caused a lot of confusion. And if you've only heard multi-channel audio using a simple Hafler circuit, it would be easy to dismiss Quadraphonic as being pretty ineffective. The equipment was expensive, at least at the start. A decoder from Radio Shack in 1972 was the equivalent in 2023 of $440 or 360 pounds. Prices came down quickly, but there was always the extra expense of two more speakers and another amplifier. But I personally feel the hassle versus reward for the average consumer just wasn't worth it. My parents bought a four speaker setup and went to the trouble of trailing wires all around the room for all four speakers. With the orientation of the room, it was very hard to get each speaker in the optimum position. This was a relatively cheap Solovox setup from Comet, and I can't even remember them using it to listen to four channel audio. To be honest, from the only grainy photo I've been able to find of this particular model, I'm not even sure it did any quadraphonic effects. Devices like this only added to the quadraphonic confusion. As casual listeners, they certainly weren't that bothered to get quadraphonic records, even though they had a large collection of music. It just didn't offer the bump in audio excitement that stereo had offered, and there were more interesting things to spend money on instead. Meanwhile, people were starting to listen to music less in the living room and more in the car, and eventually on the move, always with one or two speakers. I was all ready to write a conclusion dismissing Quadraphonic as really not that much better than stereo. The mixes don't add much, just some atmosphere to the rear channels. But then I listened to Dark Side of the Moon using Dolby Spatial Audio. That's produced from the original 1973 Quadraphonic mix, and it brings a whole new dimension to this classic album. You really should listen to it. One way is streaming it through Apple TV with Apple Music, but I'm sure there are other ways that don't involve selling your soul to the Apple ecosystem. It's apt that Pink Floyd, one of the pioneers of quadraphonic sound in live music, were producing exciting four-channel audio at the height of their creative work, and to my mind it's still one of the most exciting recordings today. So go ahead and treat yourself to a listen to recreations of those quad recordings from the 1970s on your modern home theatre system. It's likely a better experience than consumers experience back in the 70s with eight track and cheap tinny speakers and gives a better sense of the true potential of quadraphonic sound. The BBC produced heavy handed messages warning TV detector vans would descend on your area. The threat was you'd be hauled away at night for failing to pay your TV license. What on earth was all this about and could they really detect you had a TV? Watch the video on the right and find out. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.